Good morning. So, these are the topics for today, reading and listening, all of us do a lot of reading and listening in our day to day life. Uh, what we are going to look at in uh, today's and subsequent lectures is uh, how to pay attention to uh, nuances of reading and listening, uh, especially in classroom and academic setups. Now, um, you know that what is reading comprehension? Reading comprehension is uh, the level of understanding a text or a message. It involves two levels of processing that is a shallow level or that is also called low level and deep or uh, rather higher level of uh, processing information. Now, deep level happens when we as uh, readers convert the meaning of the words or the text and relate to similar texts or words. We should be able to understand um, the context. Shallow level involves on the other hand um, understanding the structure of the passage. Okay, if somebody understands the structure, we have been talking about the structure of sentences, word patterns, etcetera. So, um, at this level, it goes without saying that you are expected to learn or a practice higher or deeper level of reading. Reading different types of texts requires the use of different reading strategies and approaches. Now, this is important to understand all of us have certain strategies and certain approaches to understand a written text. Now, uh, it all depends on us what strategies we use and how we use. The best way to practice academic reading is to um, understand the text and also develop uh, um, the skill of uh, speed reading, because after all in academic context uh, in uh, also at the level of certain competitive exams, we do not have all the time in the world to read and process the text. So, it is always useful to develop the skill of speed reading, which comes with a certain amount of practice making um, reading an active process can help the reader for a better understanding of the text. And um, if I were to give you some tips about how to do or practice speed reading, you should know certain terms here that is predicting, connecting, inferring, analyzing and critiquing the text. So, it is always better to predict what comes next. Okay. So, prediction is also a kind of uh, a skill that should be practiced and that should be developed. Uh, connecting sentences, understanding the connection between sentences, inferring the meaning of sentences, all these are important. At the same time, we should be able to mentally process, analyze, critic or critique rather what is happening here and at the end be able to summarize, okay, to um, sum up whatever we have been reading. A good reader practices these skills, it does not happen overnight, it is always uh, advisable to read higher order or advanced level of uh, reading that uh, and here I am not just talking about uh, reading higher order literature, uh, but it is also advisable to read um, a good English newspaper and or good scientific journals and magazines. For example, National Geographic and Nature magazine as many of you would be interested in. So, it is always better to practice your reading and develop your reading skills and you, may, you will soon realize that reading such kinds of uh, 
magazines, journals and books. They also help in developing your vocabulary, especially your scientific vocabulary, which you, you would be requiring in your uh, academics as well as in your profession and um, career. Now, um, one of the key or one of the initial steps rather in uh, practicing reading skills is to identify the main idea. What is this passage or text all about? At the beginner's level, it is always advisable to break a text into paragraphs. So, here I would like to give you a tip that we, as writers, we are we have not uh, still moved on to developing written uh, skills or writing skills, but uh, paragraphing is extremely important to understand uh, or to be a, a practitioner of good writing. So, you have to be able to write good paragraphs and uh, while writing, um, you have to break your paragraphs into uh, according to the main ideas, the central idea they contain. So, each paragraph should have an idea. We will come to that later on, but let us understand reading and how to identify its main idea, the main ideas in a, read, uh, in a passage. So, let us look at this particular passage. Read on. Facebook Incorporated is a social networking service and website. It aims to make the world more open and connected. People use Facebook to stay connected with their friends and family to discover what is going on in the world around them and to share and express what matters to them, to the people they care about. The company offers advertisers a unique combination of reach, relevance, social context and engagement to enhance the value of their ads. Now, what is being talked about here? What is the main idea? It tells you what is Facebook. It defines Facebook. At the beginning of a, yeah, you just look at the topic sentence. Topic sentence gives you the key to the passage. Is a social networking service and websites. And what is what does it do? And then it goes on to give you a list of um, various things. It connects people. It helps people in expressing what matter to them, what they care about, and then also it is a unique platform to advertise goods. So, what is Facebook and what does it do for people? So, there is a topic sentence which tells you about what is it about, what is it? It defines face, the Facebook and then what does it do, what, are, what does it aim to do, what are the benefits of Facebook. It is not talking about the disadvantages. If at all it is there in this text, it will come at a later stage that you have to look. I have given you the link and you can look it up, but one passage tells you these things and that is the central idea and this is the way um, one needs to develop one's uh, writing and also reading. So, identify the main idea, what is, what is the passage all about? So, ask the question, what? So, uh, this is the tip that I want to give you to start practicing reading. What is the passage? Ask the question, what is the passage all about? Now, uh, look at this exercise and then we will go on to uh, solve certain questions. Questions are given at the end of this passage. It is a rather lengthy passage, read it carefully.
Do children really need such long summer breaks was a question posed by some experts recently. Apparently, such a long break disrupts their development and comes in the way of their learning process. Let us get them back to their books is perhaps their expert view, if not in so many words. One would have thought that children are doing too much during their vacations and not too little, given the plethora of classes, camps and workshops involving swimming, art, personality development, music, computers and the like that seems to cram their calendar. Even the trips taken in the name of holidays seem laden with exotic destinations and customized experience packed into a short period of time. We can do Europe in 10 days and Australia in a week and come back armed with digital memories and overflowing suitcase. Holidays are in some ways no longer a break, but an intensified search for experience not normally encountered in everyday life. It is a far cry from summer holidays one experienced while growing up for holidays every year meant one thing and one thing alone. You went back to your native place, logged in with the emotional headquarters of your extended family and spent two months with a gaggle of uncles, aunts and first and second cousins. The happiest memories of the childhood of a whole generation seem to be centered around this annual ritual of homecoming and affirmation. We tendered tacit apologies for the separateness entailed in being individuals even as we scurried back into vacation was a time sticky with oneness as who were and what we owned oozed out from our individual selves into a collective pot. Summer was not really a break, but a joint. It was the bridge used to reaffirm one's connectedness with one's larger community. One did not travel, one returned. It was not an attempt to experience the new and the extraordinary, but the one that emphatically underlined the power of the old and the ordinary. As time changes, what we seek from our summer breaks too has changed in fundamental way. Today we are attached much more to the work and summer helps us temporarily detach from this new source of identity. We refuel our individual selves now and do so with much more material than we did in the past. But for those who grew up in different times, summer was the best time of their lives. Now, here are the questions. Look at the questions and then go back to the passage. It is a very well written passage and it has ideas in every paragraph. You can identify the main ideas as well, but first let us look at, at the exercises. So, section 1 experts question the summer breaks given to children because breaks students are kept busy during the vac summer vacations. The writers happiest memories of childhood were centered around and summer break in the present times are a way of look at these questions look just do the first section and come back. Now, let us look at the second section, fill in the blanks using one word only and uh, from the passage given. The realization that children's summer breaks are dash with a plethora of activities makes one conclude that they are doing dash. Holidays have now turned into a dash for new experiences, they, these are far removed from the times when summer breaks were a time of plank with the with the extended family. It 
In the third section find words or phrases which mean the same as clearly seen or understood, access both are or both can be identified in paragraph 1 is and third uh, definition or meaning is state as a fact or declare formally para second paragraph and in the from the third paragraph beyond what is usual. So, find the words and phrases which have the same meaning as the given expressions. Let us discuss the answers now. So, um, what I was trying to do in the first section was um, to identify and understand main parts of this passage. So, the answer to the first question is that um, uh, according to the experts and you have to complete the sentence. So, what do they what happens during vacations according to these experts if they disrupt children's development and come in the way of learning process. right? And then there are second uh, the, the second uh, statement is students are kept busy during the summer vacations. They are engaged in a variety of courses, classes, uh, camps, workshops and in trips taken in the name of holidays. The third statement the writers happiest memories of childhood were centered around the annual ritual of homecoming and affirmation it is given there in the uh, final paragraphs. And summer break in the present times are a way of detaching from work and refueling ourselves. Sec, uh, section 2, the realization that children's summer breaks are packed or cramped, okay, so that is the answer. with a plethora of activities makes one conclude that they are doing much. Okay. Holidays have now turned into a search for uh, um, new experiences. These are far removed from the times when summer breaks were a time of bonding with one's family. Now, let us look at the third section find words and phrases which mean the same. So, in first paragraph clearly seen or understood is apparently, apparently it can be clearly seen and understood. Access, access of um, everything that happens in summer vacation, so plethora and then state as a fact the third one declare formally affirmation. Yeah. And then beyond what is usual, beyond what is ordinary is extraordinary. So, uh, this is uh, I gave you this lengthy passage so that we come or uh, we fall in the habit of reading lengthy passages and uh, the deal with ideas. Now, um, let us move on to do a little bit of vocabulary. In the passage that you have just read, you must have come across words such as um, affirmation and uh, uh, temporarily also emphatically normally. Now, all these words what are they? These are uh, affirmation is a noun and other three are uh, adverbs. So, that is the part of speech, but uh, how do we construct such words? and what are we now going to look at. So, affirmation and now I am going to give you the root word. So, what is the root word? Root word is affirm here and a shun or shun becomes your suffix. Suffix are those words a group of words that follow a root word and change the class of the word. So, if affirm to affirm is a is a verb then by adding t 
T-I-O-N or A-T-I-O-N, you change the class, it becomes a noun. Okay? So, this is something that is very important to uh, understand especially in good writing and speaking. Now, uh, temporarily again, the root word is temporary and then you are adding I-L-Y and changing the category. So, from adjective it be turns into an adverb. Same emphatic, emphatically, normal, normally. So, you are changing the class of a word by using suffixes. There is an, another uh, category called prefixes which also we are going to see soon. Now, um, look at this slide and uh, note down some common forms of suffixes. The a n t type words ending in a n t, a n t does that is or does something. The a r y o o r y type connected with it, the meaning is to connect with, sensory connected with sen senses, disciplinary connected with discipline. You have the a t e type which is uh, which suggests having the quality of, so bifurcate, explicate, promulgate. Then you have C R A T, which uh, that is a member of something, democrat, mm. plutocrat, aristocrat. You have the E R type, person or thing. Hmm? So, uh, let us think of some examples using E R a driver, you know, person or something uh, who does something, who does a job. So, E R uh, from drive you get driver. You have E S E type, it is uh, generally used to um, suggest the nationality or country, you know, China, Chinese, Japan, Japanese. You also have I S H type again you can use it to uh, suggest the nationality Swede, Swedish, a Dane, Danish. Now, um, another category is I N or A N uh, in which uh, so to suggest an activity in which many people take part. So, sect, sectarian, then you have the I S T form to suggest a person who practices something. You have the U R A and A G E. So, U A G E again it changes the category of the uh, mm, word or the root word. So, from post you get postage, you from parent you get parentage, from short you get short. We are short of something in so short supply, the shortage of something. So, it changes, it gives you more variety, more color to your language. You also have the URE type, uh, for example, annex becomes annexure, expose becomes exposure. So, the URE using the suffix URE, architect, architecture. MENT type, which is an action or process of doing something, for example, abridgment, argument. So, all these you also have the ION type, the discuss, discussion. So, those are some of the very few examples of suffixes which are extremely important. Now, um, um, let us do some listening at the beginning of this class today, session today I told you that I would like you to practice some listening also. Here I am going to read out um, a couple of uh, paragraphs. But, um, before I do that, I am going to give you the questions. So, you will be able to listen to the uh, passage and then uh, just take down the questions and then listen to me. I am not going to show the slides here. I am going to read out the passage. You have to just look at these questions. So, please look at this slide with questions. Question 1 is, what are the names of the three doctors? 
Second, how is the machine described as? Third, what did Mitty ask for? Fourth question, he pulled a dash, so there are two words dash dash out of the machine and inserted the pen in its place. I am going to now read out the passage and you start solving these uh, or writing answers for these questions. You will not be shown the passage this time. This is a test of listening and not a test of reading. <coughs> this passage is taken from a short story called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. So, here it goes. In the operating room, <laughs> there were whispered introductions. Dr. Remington, Dr. Mitty, Dr. Pritchard Mitford, Dr. Mitty. I have read your book on a streptothricosis, said Pritchard Mitford, shaking hands. A brilliant performance, sir. Thank you, said Walter Mitty. Didn't know you were in the States, Mitty, grumbled Remington. Calls to Newcastle, bringing Mitford and me up here for a tertiary. You are very kind, said Mitty. A huge complicated machine connected to the operating tables with many tubes and wires began at this moment to go pocket up, pocket up, pocket up. The new anesthetizer is giving way, shouted an intern. There is no one in the east who knows how to fix it. Quiet man, said Mitty in a low cool voice. He sprang to the machine which was now going pocket a pocket a queep, pocket a queep. He began fingering delicately a row of glistening dials. Give me a fountain pen. He pulled, he snapped. Someone handed him a fountain pen. He pulled a faulty piston out of the machine and inserted the pen and in its place. That will hold for 10 minutes, he said. Get on with the operation. A nurse hurried over and whispered to Renshaw and Mitty saw the man turn pale. Now, write the answers to the questions that we, dis uh, we uh, I gave you at the beginning of the passage. We will discuss the answers soon. So, first question, what are the names of the three doctors? Dr. Remington, Dr. Mitty, Dr. Pritchard Mitford. Second question, how is the machine described? A huge complicated machine. And what does Mitty ask for? He asks for, he says give me a fountain pen. He asks for a fountain pen. And the two words in the blank, faulty piston. So, now that we have been talking about machines, especially in the operating theatre or operation theatre, let us look at uh, or I will give you examples or names of certain instruments and I would like you to take some time and write the definitions of these instruments. So, the first word durometer, second machine is ohmmeter. O H M M E T E R. Third machine is figomo manometer. Is figo manomo. Is figomo manometer. S P H Y G M O M A N O M E T E R. Next is planimeter, P L A N I M E T E R. And the last one is pycnometer, P Y C N O M E T E R. Pycnometer. Now, what are these machines for? So, durometer. It measures hardness of materials. Ohmmeter measures electrical resistance. Sphygmomanometer is for measuring blood pressure. 
planimeter measures area and pycnometer it measures density of a liquid. Now, in the story this that you have uh, just seen or heard a passage from the hero Walter Mitty, um, he imagines himself as various professionals. Okay. That is his imagination, that is his way of surviving uh, his monotonous life. Now, here is an exercise and uh, I am giving you a list of professionals and you have to tell me what do these people work for as or work for. So, first word cartographer, cartographer, second word seismologist. Third word, speleologist. Next word, entomologist. Next word, antiquary. Next word, steeplejack, and you have to tell me what do these people do, and the last word is paleontologist. Paleontologist. What do these people do? A cartographer makes maps, a seismologist measures earthquakes, a speleologist studies caves, an entomologist studies insects, an antiquary is a person who is an expert in the relics of the past. A steeplejack is an expert who repairs tall buildings and structures and a paleontologist is someone who studies rocks. I would like you to uh, practice this speaking exercise and this is the question. I am giving you a question and I want you to practice, work in pairs, work with some friends and see how you can develop. I will also give you the link to develop this kind of um, abilities where you can get some information. So, it is important that you start talking and discussing uh, topics which would be of academic interest and use and value to you. So, the question is what do you know about free market environmentalism, free market environmentalism. And here is a link, please look at the slide given. This is a link, you can get more details about this topic, read it and then develop your own ideas. Before we end up this class, today's class, I would like to wind up with uh, idioms. Now, what are idioms and how we can use idioms in everyday communication? So, what are idioms? Idioms as you would know are expressions which have a meaning that is not very obvious from the individual words. For example, state of the art. Okay. It is a, 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 an expression very commonly used, it means something that is built upon latest technology. Why do we use idioms? 
Why can't we just use, I use the latest technology? We use idioms because they add color and variety to our language. Now, I am going to give you a list of idioms. You have a dictionary and I would like you to practice and use these idioms in uh, your day to day communication. It will also help you in your various academic activities. So, this exercise is purely for self learning and you have to do it yourself. The first idiom is to pin something down, P I N pin, to pin something down. Next, to cost an arm and a leg, an arm and a leg. Third, to beat around the bush, to beat around the bush. Fourth one, devil's advocate, devil's advocate. Next, to sit on the fence, to sit on the fence. And the last expression of phrase is conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory. Look up these words in your dictionary, see how you can use in sentences of your own. So, thank you very much and with this we end today's class.